Welcome to the Joseph Goldstein Insight Hour. This podcast is an expression of our shared interest in self-discovery. Join Joseph as he shares his deep knowledge of the path of mindfulness. If you are interested in supporting this podcast, please go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Joseph. Tonight, we'll continue the series of talks on the Satipatthana Sutta, and in particular, the fourth foundation of mindfulness. <laughs> Buddha called this foundation mindfulness of dhammas, dhamma in Pali, dharma in Sanskrit. And dhamma here means categories of experience or categories of phenomena. And this is the investigation of how different elements of mind and body function in our experience. And in this fourth foundation, the Buddha included instructions on working with the hindrances, with the sense fears, the aggregates, the factors of awakening, and the Four Noble Truths. So we left off last year in the middle of the discussion of the seven factors of awakening. So just as a reminder of the central importance of these enlightenment factors, I'd like to read some of the Buddha's words about this from the Pali text, from the suttas. A bhikkhu approached the Buddha and asked, Factors of enlightenment. In what way are they called factors of enlightenment? (laughs) They lead to enlightenment, bhikkhu. In that sense, they are called factors of enlightenment. Bhikkhus, the seven factors of enlightenment when developed and cultivated are noble and emancipating. They lead the one who acts upon them to the complete destruction of suffering. Bhikkhus, I will teach you seven things that lead to non-decline. What are the seven things that lead to non-decline? They are the seven factors of enlightenment. What is the path and the way that leads to the destruction of craving? They are the seven factors of enlightenment. Bhikkhus, I do not see even one thing that when developed and cultivated leads to the abandoning of the things that fetter so effectively as this namely the seven factors of enlightenment. Venerable Sir, it is said, wise and alert, wise and alert. In what way, Venerable Sir, is one called wise and alert? Because it is because one has developed and cultivated the seven factors of enlightenment that one is called wise and alert. So they have some power. What are these seven factors? I think you're familiar with them. They're the factors of mindfulness, of investigation of dhammas, which is the wisdom factor, is energy, rapture, calm, concentration, and wisdom. And equanimity is the last. Mindfulness, investigation, energy, rapture, calm, concentration, and equanimity. I think it's worth reflecting on just how rare it is in spiritual teachings to have such a clear and precise understanding of what leads to awakening. And the Buddha so clearly laid it out because it takes it out of the realm of mysticism, takes it out of the realm of unquestioning faith or the realm of accident. It moves it into the realm of understanding how the mind works, of what factors condition suffering and what factors lead to freedom. 
Well, it's very interesting in the text how the Buddha describes this progression of these seven factors and how each one arises naturally out of the preceding one. And so they really are a chain of sequential development. So the first of the awakening factors and the one that is the foundation and the underlying condition for them all is mindfulness, you know, in Pali Sati. When there's a continuity and a momentum of mindfulness, of awareness, which means a coming face to face with experience, that's the characteristic of mindfulness, it brings us face to face with what's arising. Out of this momentum and continuity of awareness, then we're present enough to actually investigate and understand what it is that's going on. So we can see how mindfulness is the foundation then for investigation. And this is the second factor of enlightenment. Now investigation, investigation of dhammas, is the wisdom factor of mind. And it means both the direct experience of the nature of what's arising, both the specific qualities of the experience and also the general characteristics of impermanence and unreliability and insubstantiality. So it's investigation which sees and understands that for ourselves. But there's another aspect to this investigation of Dhamma as well, and it's an interesting one to understand because this factor of enlightenment also correlates our experience within the broader scope of the Buddha's teachings. So I'd just like to give an example of this because it's a way of enlarging our own particular experience and putting it in the context of a much larger framework of understanding. So it's just one example of how the enlightenment factors unfold through mindfulness and investigation. Through those factors, we begin to see for ourselves and to realize for ourselves what the Buddha taught regarding what is skillful and what is unskillful in our unfolding practice. I mean, we can have studied the teachings, and we can know from the teachings this is wholesome, this is unwholesome, but it's through mindfulness and investigation that we really see for ourselves, yes, this is a skillful state of mind. It leads to happiness. This is an unskillful state of mind. It leads to suffering. So with these factors of awakening, this is no longer book knowledge. This is something that we have seen directly for ourselves. So as a result of this investigation and understanding, it leads very naturally into the next factor of awakening, which is energy. And energy leads to rapture or joy. And they all follow naturally one from the other. So just again, as an example of how this works, When we see clearly and directly in our experience what is wholesome and what is not wholesome, then we are motivated to arouse the energy, to arouse that quality of balanced effort, the strength, the courage of that particular state to develop what's wholesome and to abandon what's unwholesome. It's through seeing, through understanding that, then, then, yes, we're motivated. We arouse that energy. Let me cultivate, let me strengthen, let me develop that which leads to happiness in my life. Let me abandon that which leads to suffering. On one level, it seems so obvious. 
you know, that once we see clearly, really see clearly, then we can begin to make wiser choices. So we see a powerful expression of this and the sequence of these unfolding enlightenment factors in our own lives when we actively engage in the practice of the precepts. Because following the precepts is a decision we make. This is a commitment. It's a commitment to refrain from certain unwholesome actions, actions that lead to suffering. And so we arouse the energy factor to make this commitment based on our understanding. We've seen something, we've realized something. And so the energy is aroused, yes, I will do this. And contrary to possible apprehensions that this will be a burdensome and difficult task, you know, we might, before undertaking this practice of the precepts, think of it as sort of a noble but rather unwelcome commitment. We find in the actual practice of them just the opposite. The strength and the energy, which is the virya factor, it's the energy factor of awakening, the strength and commitment of that factor actually brings a feeling of joy and confidence. Because once we've made that commitment, once we've made that decision and implemented in our lives, we're no longer carried away by old habits. We're no longer continually wavering about whether we should do something or not do something. Wavering about actions that we know are unskillful, even as we might have the habit of continuing to do them. It's like based on mindfulness, based on investigation of what's skillful and unskillful, based on the energy of making the commitment, based on the joy, the piti, the rapture that comes from having made that commitment, it's like we plant the flag with steadfastness and with courage in the field of right action. We're saying with our lives, yes. This is how I'm going to be living my life. His Holiness, the 16th Karmapa, summed this up. He said, if you have 100% dedication and confidence in the teachings, then every living situation can be part of the practice. You can be living the practice instead of just doing it. You know, and it's this feeling really of these first four factors of mindfulness, of investigation, of energy, of rapture. We're living the practice rather than just doing it. It's not something apart from us. We really are beginning to embody it. The enlightenment factor, factor of rapture, of PT, sometimes it's translated as joy, is born both from the freedom from remorse that we have in following the precepts. You know, it's really the freedom of remorse that comes from the virtues of non-harming. When that's strong in our lives, so there is a feeling of joy. And this rapture also comes from an increasing momentum of awareness that comes out of a sustained and balanced energy. So rapture is this quality of intense interest and arises from a close and caring attention to whatever is arising. Rapture is just the opposite of boredom. And boredom means lack of attention. So when we're feeling bored or disinterested in our practice, It's actually very useful feedback. Don't just struggle with it, learn from it. 
when we really look at the quality of boredom, we see that we're in a state of what I call more or less mindful. Right? We're kind of mindful, we're kind of there, but not really. There's, there's a distance. So when we see that, when we feel the boredom, and we see its characteristics, oh, not really connected. So then based on that understanding, we can arouse the feeling of rapture, which means intense interest in what's happening by coming close to the object. It can be as simple as feeling a step more precisely, more carefully. Not struggling, but just listening, being receptive in a very caring way. Lady Sayadaw, who was one of the great Burmese masters, uh, he lived in the early 20th century. He said, rapture is the joy and happiness that appears when the power of seeing and knowing increases. Okay. Rapture is the joy and the happiness that appears when the power of seeing and knowing increases. One time, Ananda, who was the Buddha's cousin and attendant, and who was with the Buddha all the time, and always asking the questions that everybody else wanted to ask, but he was the one who uh, would actually do it. He had this conversation with the Buddha. What, O Venerable One, is the reward and blessing of wholesome morality? The Buddha replied, freedom from remorse, Ananda. And what is the reward and blessing of freedom from remorse? Gladness, Ananda. And what is the reward and blessing of gladness? Rapture, Ananda. And so he just goes on through this long list, which I'll continue later in the talk of how each quality leads in a very natural way to the next. In the last talks on these factors of enlightenment, there was a detailed discussion on this particular factor of rapture. So tonight I want to continue with the next factor in the unfolding sequence. And it's one that plays a crucial role in the path of liberation, yet it is often overlooked or underemphasized in our practice. And so I found it very interesting to really investigate and explore what this particular factor is and how it manifests for us. And this is the enlightenment factor of calm. And the Pali word for calm is pasadi, and it can be translated as serenity, as calm, as tranquility, as composure. It's the soothing factor of mind that quiets down disturbances, and it manifests in the mind as peacefulness or coolness, manifests that way both in the mind and the body. It's like sitting down in the shade of a cool tree on a hot, sweltering day. Now just imagine, we're not quite there yet, but we will be. You know, just really hot, and then just sit down in the coolness of the shade and that feeling of ease. Or it might be the feeling of a mother you know, soothing a feverish child with a cooling touch. You know, it's just that sense of cooling out, of calming down. This factor of paucity encompasses both physical composure and also mental tranquility. It's this quality of calm or tranquility, that keeps the mind composed and unruffled in times of difficulty. 
Yeah, you know, we can can know this, and we can intuit it. Just you know, when we're with people who may be in very difficult circumstances, but who are well established and calm, it's like they just stay unruffled. They can deal with what's arising, but there's a composure in the mind in doing it. And in the Abhidhamma, the Buddhist psychology, it's also described how this factor, enlightenment factor of calm, also brings with it other associated wholesome states. Wholesome states of lightness of mind and body, wieldiness, proficiency. And the last one is quite interesting, the last quality it brings, which is sincerity. Now, the first three of these qualities seemed obvious to me. You know, the lightness, the wieldiness, the proficiency, you can kind of see how that comes with calm. But then when I read, it also brings sincerity, or in some of the translations it says rectitude, you know, uprightness of mind, straightness of mind. It was interesting to reflect on how that comes about through calm. When our minds are tranquil, when the mind is undisturbed, there is a natural genuineness, a natural honesty that's there. There's a freedom from duplicity in that calm because we're at ease. The mind is at ease. Sometimes in meditation teachings, we hear of the danger of becoming attached to this wonderfully calming, peaceful state of mind. And I've heard it often, you know, from my teachers, like, don't get attached to it. And it's an important caution. But still, the Buddha gave this particular quality a lot of importance He emphasized it by including it in the seven factors of awakening. So it's not a sideshow. Calm is a central factor in this whole path of liberation. And so it's worth really exploring both what it is, how it can be developed. The happiness that comes from a tranquil mind plays a key role in this whole path of awakening. I've understood both the caution and the importance of calm as my own practice unfolded, you know, over all these years. Because when we first touch this space in ourselves, this space of deep tranquility, it can be so enticing you know, there is such a profound sense of relaxation, of relief, of ease, especially as we contrast it with the speed and the distractedness of our daily lives. You know, phew, finally, some calm. Or we contrast it just with the struggles that we often have in our meditation when we finally come to this place of tranquility. It feels like such a relief. The danger at this point, and this is the caution, is that we start practicing only for the calm. It's so delicious. It feels so good, so easeful, that if we don't really understand the whole path, then we're practicing only for that. We become attached to it and identified with it forgetting that the calm itself is still just another constructed state. So it's easy to sink into just enjoying it. And we can forget to bring mindfulness to it. So here the Buddha gave some very direct instructions in the Satipatthana Sutta, about working with 
calm and all the factors of enlightenment. You know, and the instructions are very clear. He said, if the tranquility factor or any of the others is present, one knows the tranquility factor is present in me. If not present, one knows it is not present in me. One knows how the unawakened factor of tranquility can arise and how the arisen factor of tranquility can be perfected by development. So the Buddha is talking directly to us and directly to our practice. He's saying, be mindful. When calm is present, know it's present. When it's not present, know it's not present. If it's not there, know how we can cultivate it. If it is present, know how we can bring it to perfection, to fulfillment. So it's mindfulness which knows whether it's present or not. And then the other enlightenment factors of investigation, of energy, of rapture. I mean, all these states, would, we might call it meditative intelligence, you know, where we're really understanding our mind and how these different factors are working. We understand how these factors lead onward to the development and fulfillment of tranquility, but without becoming lost in it, without becoming ensnared by it. So then how do we develop and perfect this beautiful, peaceful state? How do we develop it and perfect it in our practice? The Buddha gave some general instructions in the Satipatthana Sutta for all of the enlightenment factors and then specific ones for the cultivation of calm and each of the others. So this is his very um, clear instruction. He said, Bhikkhus, as to internal factors, I do not see any other factor that is so helpful for the arising of the seven factors of enlightenment as this, wise attention. When a bhikkhu is accomplished in wise attention, it is to be expected that the seven factors of enlightenment will be developed and cultivated. Bhikkhus, as to external factors, I do not see any other factor that is so helpful for the arising of the seven factors of enlightenment as this, good friendship. When a bhikkhu is accomplished in good friendship, it is to be expected that the seven factors of enlightenment will be developed and cultivated. Wise attention and good friends. So we have these good friends in the Buddha, and in his teachings. The Buddha and the teachings are pointing us first to the awareness of these enlightenment factors, and then he encourages us to frequently pay attention to them. So how do we do this? Again, it's all in the Satipatthana Sutta, which is what makes it such an extraordinary discourse. In one of the first sets of instructions in mindfulness of the body and breathing, the Buddha outlines a very simple four-step progression of being with the breath. Very simple. The first step, the first instruction. One knows when breathing in, I know I'm breathing in. When breathing out, I know I'm breathing out. Pretty basic. Breathing in, no, I'm breathing in. Breathing out, no, I'm breathing out. Second step. Breathing in long, I know I'm breathing in long. Breathing in short, I know I'm breathing in short. So we begin to pay a little more careful attention, a little closer. 
you know, really seeing, being mindful. Is it a long breath? Is it a short breath? Now, in steps three and four, there's an interesting shift of language where the Buddha changes the verb from I know breathing in or out, switches from the verb know to the verb to train. So that's, that's interesting. It's not by accident. You know, big steps three and four imply just a little more active engagement. And in the first two steps, it's just knowing, bare knowing. In steps three and four, there's a slight sense of engagement in our experience of the breath. So step three, one trains thus, I shall breathe in, experiencing the whole body. One trains thus, I shall breathe out, experiencing the whole body. And then the fourth step, and this is what brings us back to calm. The fourth step, training thus, I shall breathe in calming the bodily formations. Breathing out, I will train calming the bodily formations. Right? So this is something that we actively do as we're breathing in, as we're breathing out, feeling the whole body, and then breathing in, breathing out, calming the formations. Now, there are some different interpretations of what the whole body means. Some interpretations say it means the whole body of the breath. That is the fullness of the breath from beginning to end. Some interpretations say it means the whole physical body. We can experiment for ourselves. As you sit and you're with the breath, you can either keep the attention on the whole breath body or you can experience the breath in the whole physical body. Just see what works. You know, see what comes most easily and naturally. So to apply this in our practice, you know, when we sit, might be helpful at the beginning of a sitting just to start with a body scan or a few body scans, both to feel the whole body and to relax you know, and to calm the formations. So relaxing the eyes you know, and the jaw and the shoulders and the chest you know, and the belly and the legs. So go through the body a couple of times, just relaxing, calming the formations. And then as we bring the attention to the breath in the body, this is something I've been doing in my practice basically since working on this talk. <laughs> because in just exploring this enlightenment factor of calm, I realized there's a lot that I hadn't been doing with it. So I thought, well, the Buddha was right about so much else. He probably has something useful to say here too. So in sitting, just in breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, and we can remind ourselves with the words, with actually using the words, breathing in, calm the bodily formations. Breathing out, calm the bodily formations. Well, maybe it's just the simple word, you know, in, with each in-breath or out-breath, calming, calming calming the in-breath, calming the out-breath. Experiment. Just see. It's like cueing the mind to experience the calming factor, the tranquilizing factor. It's been amazing to me, as I've been doing this, as I say, quite recently, the power of it. Why? Why is there such a direct uh, effect Because often there is a subtle, and sometimes not so subtle, striving or efforting, even with something as simple as the breath. You know, we're watching the breath or feeling the breath, 
I mean, in order to get concentrated, or in order to deepen, or in order to have peace, or in order to get to the next breath, but some level of leaning forward, of wanting, of wanting to get something. So reminding ourselves repeatedly, it might be with each breath, it might be maybe not that often, but quite frequently, by reminding ourselves repeatedly to calm the formations of the body and the mind. That reminding to calm actually brings about a letting go. It brings about this settling back into a more tranquil state that is free of wanting. So then we can apply the Buddhist teachings as we experience, even for short times, the taste of the calm, the taste of the tranquility, then we give wise attention to that state. We learn to recognize it. We become familiar with it. The Buddha said that frequently giving attention to calm, frequently giving attention to it, is the nutriment for the arising and fulfillment of this factor of enlightenment. Do you see how it's all working? It's like we use the instructions and the breath, you know, those four steps or some variation of those four steps, but including with each breath, calming the in-breath, calming the out-breath, calming the formations. And then as we experience that letting go, that relaxation, that ease, we give attention to that quality of mind. We say, oh yes, this is calm. This is tranquility. Because greater familiarity with it gives greater access to it. We can also practice tranquility as we move about. It's not only in the sitting. So what's the opposite of tranquility or composure as we're moving about? Very often the opposite is a certain feeling of agitation or a certain feeling of rushing. And rushing can happen whether we're moving quickly or slowly. It's not about speed. The feeling of rushing is that energetic toppling forward where it's as if our minds are ahead of ourselves, right? In anticipation of what we're doing or where we're going. It's a kind of energetic excitability, you know, that doesn't allow for the ease and composure of the mind. One of the most beautiful images in my mind of this enlightenment factor of calm was practicing in Asia, in Burma, and I was particularly watching the Burmese women yogis. Now, I don't really know what was going on inside, but in terms of the physical composure and tranquility of how they moved about the monastery, it was so beautiful to watch. It was so graceful and easeful, you know, and it was just manifesting this caring, non-rushed, attention to what they were doing and it was it was really beautiful it was like watching a dance and it was really manifesting this aspect of composure in movement so we can practice that it's not really our cultural norm you know but it's worth keeping in mind especially in this context where you have the opportunity to do that that's settling back. There's one phrase which has helped me a lot to remember to settle back. So when I'm walking, whether on retreat or off, and whether moving quickly or slowly, 
when I'm walking and I just feel not quite collected in it. You know, there's some kind of wanting in the mind or slight rushing. Just the phrase, when walking, just walk. When walking, just walk. It's the reminder that we can simply be aware of the movement without a wanting to get something or without a wanting to get somewhere. Right? So we let go of the efforting, the striving, and we just settle back when walking, just walk. And in my experience, each time I say that phrase, I can feel... It's a settling back into the moment, a sense of ease, a sense of greater calm. Of course, this can be extended to all other activities. When walking, just walk. When eating, just eat. When showering, just shower. When seeing, just see. Our minds makes the practice very complicated. You know, but this is a reminder of the simplicity of it. And in that simplicity, we connect with this feeling of calm and tranquility. As we learn to recognize and pay attention to the quality of calm, so we really learn about it of what that experience is throughout the day, we begin to have a greater understanding of the role this particular factor plays in the larger context of awakening. So as I say, it's not just about the peacefulness of the state. It's a factor of enlightenment. It plays a role in our liberation. So in one discourse, the Buddha said, these two have a share in clear knowing. Which two? Tranquility and insight. When tranquility is developed, desire is abandoned. When insight is developed, ignorance is abandoned. Okay, so there's something really quite important here. These two have a share in clear knowing, tranquility and insight. When tranquility is developed, desire is abandoned. When insight's developed, ignorance is abandoned. So observe how in moments of calm, you know, as you're practicing it either with calming the breath in the sitting or composure as you're moving through the day, First, recognize when calm is present, when the mind is tranquil. So learn about that particular state of mind. And then notice how in that state of calm, the mind is free of desire. It's free of wanting. It's free of restlessness. And all of the subtle agitation that accompanies those states Now something happens when the mind is calm and free of desire, even temporarily. What happens is that a kind of happiness arises. It's a kind of happiness and ease. And it's a happiness that's more subtle and more refined than the joy of rapture, which can be a little uh, energetic, you know, a little excited. But the joy or the happiness that comes from calm is very peaceful. So it's it's a refined and subtle kind of joy. And it's this happiness that is born from tranquility, which is the conditioning factor for the arising of concentration. So it all happens very lawfully, very naturally. Just to go back to that dialogue between Ananda and the Buddha. 
O oh Venerable One, what is the reward and blessing of rapture, tranquility, Ananda? And what is the reward and blessing of tranquility, happiness, Ananda? And what is the reward and blessing of happiness, concentration, Ananda? And then it goes on even all the way to enlightenment. You know, it just follows the sequence. But I found both in my own practice and in teaching and in the teachings I've heard that even though the Buddha clearly laid out this progression with calm playing a very central role, that it's often overlooked, you know, because it's sandwiched between two jazzier factors. It's sandwiched between rapture and concentration. You know, and so often we hear in the teachings, you know, about the development of rapture and what that's like, and then really make the effort to be concentrated. And so we get involved in really trying to deepen our concentration. It's not so often that this factor of calm is highlighted as actually the conditioning force. It's the conditioning factor for concentration to arise in an easeful way. You know, I know from my own practice how many times I would give a lot of emphasis to developing samadhi, to developing concentration, based on effort. You know, I would be making a strong effort to concentrate. But it was with a kind of striving, you know, or an effort in quality that actually got in the way. In my effort to concentrate, I was actually practicing and cultivating desire. And I was just cultivating the wanting mind unknowingly. And of course, that's exactly what hinders concentration, which is why we often find ourselves in a struggle to develop concentration, because we're doing it in such a way that actually is fostering what hinders it. It's precisely this awakening factor of calm that has the function of cooling out the desiring mind. Tranquility has the power to abandon desire. When tranquility is developed, desire is abandoned. And then the tranquility leads to the happiness, which then leads to a very natural arising of concentration. This is what is so wonderful about the Buddhist teachings. You know, just the amazing clarity and depth of understanding what conditions what. It's really the laws of dependent arising. He had such a profound understanding of the nature of the mind, of the nature of all of these factors, and how they work together and how they work in sequence and what leads to what. You know, and all the tools that he offered us for exploring this for ourselves, it's not at all a question of philosophy and it's not a question of belief. It's really about the understanding of our own minds. Besides the role calm plays in the progression of the awakening factors, we can also see its direct link to clear seeing and wisdom. And Katagiri Roshi, uh, who was really a wonderful uh, contemporary Zen master who died some years ago, in his teachings on the Zen master Dogen, he explored the nature of time, impermanence, and freedom. And he did it in just a 
and this is Dogen's teachings, a, a very, very interesting way. So I wanted to read just a short passage from Karagiri Roshi's book, which is called Each Moment is the Universe. According to the Buddhist teaching, all beings in the universe appear and disappear in a moment. The term impermanence expresses the functioning of moment or the appearance and disappearance of all beings as a moment. It means that all life is transient, constantly appearing and disappearing, constantly changing. You are transient, I am transient, and Buddha is transient. Everything is transient. Wherever you may go, transiency follows you. Transiency is the naked nature of time. In day-to-day life, you don't perceive the transient structure of time because your rational mind cannot recognize the flux of moments. The true tempo of time is too quick for your mind to keep up with, so you sense a gap between you and time. Then, because of that gap, you feel that your life is completely separate from the rest of the universe. All of us experience a gap between our minds and the reality of time. That's why we suffer. Then, instead of accepting the transient nature of life and facing impermanence with a way-seeking mind, we want to escape and find something that will satisfy us so that we can feel relief. But actually, there is no gap between your mind and time, not even the space of a piece of paper. Even though your mind cannot keep up with the quick changes of time, You already exist in the domain of impermanence, together with everyone and everything in the cosmic universe. As a human being, you inherently have a great capability that enables you to realize this truth, to experience your life with deep joy. To know this joy, we practice looking at ourselves with a calm mind. Through the practice of tranquility, we can catch up with the quick tempo of time and see deeply into what it is to be human. So if you want to know yourself and live comfortably in the transient reality of a moment, make your body and mind calm. And then it just goes on. It's through this tranquil factor the calm factor of mind that we open up to the experience of the rapidity of change. And we see that we are that process of change. We're not separate. It's not that there's a self looking at change, looking at time. What we call self is this process of change happening very, very rapidly. As the mind becomes more tranquil, more calm, more peaceful, and we bring wisdom to that peace, then we can experience this non-separation from the flow of change. We see that there is no self standing apart from it. And that what we call self is simply an appearance arising out of the interplay of ever-changing phenomena. The more we can relax into this play, the play of change, the play of time, the less we grasp and hold on. And in letting go of any clinging to anything, the mind is liberated. So i just like to close with a few lines from a Japanese nun. Her name was Tejitsu. She was the abbess of a famous nunnery in Japan. 
And this really describes her moment of awakening. This is in a book called Women of the Way by Sally Teasdale. So Tejutsu saw that arising arose, abided, and fell away. She saw that knowing this arose, abided, and fell away. Then she knew there was nothing more than this, no ground, nothing to lean on stronger than the cane she held, nothing to lean upon at all, and no one leaning. And she opened the clenched fist in her mind and let go and fell into the midst of everything. This is our practice. This is the practice of the factors of awakening opening the clenched fist of our minds, letting go and falling into the midst of everything. Let's sit for just a moment. Breathing in, calm the in-breath. Breathing out, calming the out-breath. 